Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Sign up for GoToMeeting using promo code TWIST to begin your free trial. And by Igloo, an intranet you'll actually like. Visit igloosoftware.com slash thisweekend for a chance to win an iPad mini. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's This Week in Startups. We've got a great episode for you today. Ring a Doc, Uber for Doctors is going to be on the program. What a great idea that is. And we're going to do an Ask Jason segment. We've got some great questions. How do a CEO and CTO get along? And uh, how do you deal with being a lonely single founder CEO or a single founder of a startup as opposed to two founders? Really great questions coming up on the Ask Jason segment. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said money is the root of all Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I am your humble host, Jason Calacanis, here each week, twice a week. I um, have different entrepreneurs on the program, and they talk about what they're trying to build, how they're trying to make a dent in the universe, and this week will be no different. Uh, we've got a really clever um, a really clever idea on the program, Ring-A-Doc, which you can go check out at ringadoc.com, um, which is basically Uber for doctors, and we're going to actually do a demo of it live on the show and uh, talk to the founder, Jordan Michaels. He's actually the CEO and co-founder. I always got to be careful with that founder, co-founder. And then, hey, actually, that's a good lead into we're going to do a couple of Ask Jasons, which is basically just super fans and founders asking me questions, and uh, a lot of them have to do with being a single founder and uh, relationships between multiple founders. And so we're going to get into that sort of psychology and interpersonal relationships and how that affects a startup uh, in the second half of the program. One of the great things that we've done um, over the last uh, couple of months, and it's really turned out great, uh, is This Week in Startups Live. And we're going to be doing one on Friday, February 8th, a week from today, I believe. Today is the first. Is that right? Yeah. No, today's the 29th. Today's Tuesday the 29th. Yeah, a week from this Friday will be um, February 8th. And in San Francisco at Rocket Space, I'll be interviewing live on stage our good friend, Dave McClure of 500 Startups, he's uh, really just a fantastic angel investor and force for good. If you want to get one of the t- fewer, oh no, it's sold out, sorry. Uh, but you can add yourself to the waiting list uh, for this event by going to Twist Live 3, Twist Live the number three dot eventbrite.com. And uh, yeah, we charge a whopping $2 per ticket. The reason we charge $2 is so that you have to put your credit card in and you take it a little more seriously. I don't want any drive-by signups. But uh, this event has been great. It's the third one we're doing. And great job, Brandis and Kieran and DeMont and everybody who's working on it to make those live events work out great for our audience. And it's very rewarding for me to see all you folks there and just meet all the fans of the show who, uh, like myself, are learning about entrepreneurship, learning how to do it better um, and faster and more effectively. That's the whole point of the show. And one of the tools you're going to use to be a great entrepreneur, how's that for a segue, is go to meeting, go to meeting. Meeting is believing. I just got off a go to meeting with an awesome company that I think is going to win the launch festival on March 4th, 5th, and 6th. I'm not kidding. I saw something so spectacular in the. I'll just say quantified self space that I was just blown away by this. And it was actually something that came as a referral from somebody who is an angel investor who was on the program recently and said, I invested in this. It's incredible. I saw it today over GoToMeeting. The person was actually demoing the physical product, literally doing jumping jacks and getting up and down and showing me the product over video while showing me a presentation at the same time. Meeting is believing. And this was my second go-to meeting of the day. It's only one o'clock right now. In the morning, I had a, a call with um, some folks uh, in the marketing group at Dyn, D-Y-N. You guys all know Dyn DNS. I joined the board of that company there in New Hampshire. And I meet with them regularly with the CEO, with the uh, marketing team, with the other board members over go-to meeting. And it feels just like I'm right there in their offices in New Hampshire, flipping back and forth, giving control of my, de- my desktop to them, them demoing their desktop, all this kind of great stuff going back and forth. They have a new feature. You can present with your iPad, which I'll be using that because uh, so one of these days I'm going to be on an island somewhere. Uh, that's the dream, right? We're all going to be on an island somewhere. I don't, why is that the dream for everybody? I want to be on an island alone with uh, my iPad on the beach doing my uh, meetings. But anyway, that's the, that's the dream. 
and the dream is now possible. You can present with your iPad. And that, that's the key word there. You're not just going to, with GoToMeeting, uh, participate in the conference call. You can actually present on your iPad. And boy, is that an awesome feature. Beautiful HD faces works on Macs, PCs. Um, go get your free 30-day trial by visiting. Go visit GoToMeeting.com. Click the Try It Free button and use the promo code START, S-T-A-R-T. Is that right? Not twist? Is that, uh, the promo code is now START, right? Is it START or twist? Twist. You sure it's twist? Okay. Visit GoToMeeting.com. Click the Try It Free button and use the promo code twist. GoToMeeting. Meeting is believing. I use it all the time. Actually, we're going to use it for our interview today. So just, you know, if you, if you need to know how I feel about the product, I did two meetings before that and I'm using it on my show. I, I've done three go-to meetings. I, I feel like I should pay 10 times more for this product than I already do. It's well worth it. And everybody thank at GoToMeeting on their Twitter accounts. All right. I think we've got most of the um, housekeeping done. The launch festival and hackathon. Uh, the festival is the fourth, fifth, and sixth. It's about uh, just over a month away, about 35, 36 days away. And the hackathon with $50,000 in investment prizes will be uh, the second and third and fourth. And there's already 36 teams. I think we're going to have 50 teams. So if you want to get in there and join one of the existing teams, you just go to festival.launch.co or go to launch.co and click on the festival icon. You'll see hackathon there. Click on that. Boom. Sign up for the hackathon. It's going to be amazing. And that's going to happen Saturday, Sunday into Monday. So it's really the first time there's going to be a 48-hour hackathon, which is kind of cool. Today on the program... Jordan uh, Michaels is the CEO and co-founder of Ringadoc, uh, which is, I just saw this, they're backed by Founders Fund, which, um, you know, is Sean Parker and Luke and all, and Peter Thiel and all those smart cats over there. Um, and so let me welcome to the program, Jordan Michaels. Hey, Jason, how are you? I'm well, how are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Oh, excited to have you. You know, I saw this idea and I just said to myself, my God, that's genius. Uh, how did you come up with the idea? <laughs> Sure, sure. Well, actually, uh, I have a bit of a unique story. I was a uh, discouraged pre-med student down in Los Angeles at the University of Southern California. And through kind of my experiences at school and seeing where the healthcare industry was headed, more importantly, with relations to patients and physicians, uh, wasn't sure it was for me and actually had a really tough decision a couple years ago, uh, deciding to of not, deciding not to go to medical school in lieu of pursuing Ringadoc, which I had founded actually in 2010 after I graduated college. And basically the idea came from that there was this third party of systems, so to speak, in the form of insurance companies and employers really dictating the way that patients can receive care and mm -hmm. the way that providers could provide care. And to me, the common denominator was communication. Uh, and it seemed that there was this point missing between you know, Googling something, going on WebMD, looking on some symptom checkers, and the in-person appointment, which is, you know, urgent care center, wait three weeks for an appointment or go to the emergency room. And that's really where we wanted to start with, uh, with Ringadoc. Okay. Well, let's, let's do a demo here. I have a camera over my shoulder. Is that right? Oh, there it is. Hey. So um, how do I, uh, oh, there, look at that. I almost got it perfect. Just, uh, so here's an iPhone 5. I guess this is my assistant Bryce's. Um, so let's go first check Bryce's history at his Chrome and see if he's downloading any porn. No. Uh, <laughs> so you're going to ring me. I see the Ringadoc. Uh, there's Ringadoc right there. That's sure. The and, so yeah, I'm going to play the what, doctor? Am I playing a doctor? Yeah, what, what I'm going to show you actually, so as you know, we initially developed it uh, for, so that patients can call an on-demand doctor. What we're going to demonstrate today, because we got really good feedback from the doctors, they wanted to use this technology with their own patients. So that's what we're actually demoing today. Is that, okay. Is, as if you were my my uh, my personal physician. So I'm okay. Gonna go ahead so we've already got a relationship. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to call the office, okay. uh, and you you might not be able to hear it. Let's see. Thank you for calling the office of. Yeah, we can hear it. Hold it closer. If this is a life-threatening emergency, please hang up and dial 911 for office hours, information, prescription refills, or to leave a voicemail. Please press one. If this is a call from a patient, doctor, or a hospital with an urgent matter that requires immediate attention, please press 3 to reach the hospital provider. So I'm going to indicate that I want to speak to my doctor. Yep. It's going to, it's going to confirm my phone number. I'm going to give them my name, okay. Jordan Michaels. I'm going to explain why I'm calling. Hey, Dr. Jason, I think I might be coming down with a sinus infection. I haven't been feeling well the past couple of days. Uh, please let me know what I should do. 
And that's really all that I have to do as the patient. And what's really nice about that too is I'm calling the same doctor's office number I've been calling for years. So we're getting ah. the patient at the point where they've already been using it. He's calling right. their doctor. So I have an urgent uh, meet, I have an urgent message. It says I'm going to put in the mm -hmm. uh, secret password. <laughs> okay, I put in my PIN. Uh, it says no new messages. Oh wait, welcome. You've got some new messages. And uh, mm -hmm. let me just do that right here. And I guess that uh, 818 number is uh, the new message? Yep. There. Okay. So I'll click on that one, and I'm playing it. The patient. Jordan Michael. Complains of the following. Hey, Dr. Jason. I think I might be coming down with a sinus infection. Okay. I haven't been feeling well the past couple so of days. From here, you can actually either call me back directly, and we right. can get into a conversation that's tracked by the system and the front office has access to, or you can send me a recorded message, and my phone will ring with a direct message from you. Uh, and what's nice about too is if I miss that call and I were to call your office back, hmm. the message would th would be right there waiting for me. So I can either I can send a message right now, and I can just say send message, uh, record, and uh, hey, listen, you need to come into the office. That's very serious. Uh, please uh, schedule an appointment, and uh, then I can send that to you. Mm -hmm. So just that simple. So if I'm on a golf course and I'm a doctor, I can just give you. I don't have to like wait for it to ring or call you back. I just send you the message because like, why do I want to try to get you on the phone live? You're gonna ask me 50 more questions. Right, right. So actually, um, your response was actually perfect for where we additionally want to take the product moving forward mm -hmm. to kind of bring it back to more of that consumer-focused product, right. which is that we want to actually allow doctors to get paid for some of these calls that they're doing. So rather than saying, listen, I, I need you to come into the office because that's a billable visit potentially for yeah. me, we want to give the patient the ability to handle these visits outside of the office and also the doctor the ability to provide those. So... What about me launching a video conference to actually ask you like to get on a video chat and actually be able to look at your throat through the camera on the phone, obviously? Yeah, and that is uh, where we're, we're going to be adding that to the product uh, this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually we've done video conferencing in the past on the direct-to-consumer product. Uh, we saw that patients more so were still opting to just do a phone call. But as the you know the the great part is is once the doctors have this application on their phone, they can just update it when we add the new heavier features for video conferencing. Picture sharing is actually a much higher request because you're allowed to get a, a higher res photo rather than moving the camera. Ah, so, so that, I have this rash on my foot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I take a picture of the rash in the foot. They say, listen, I, I can tell from that it's probably athlete's foot. Just get some whatever athlete's foot cream from your store. Exactly, exactly. And uh, they'll also be able to prescribe as well as what, we're, what, we're, what, what we've seen in, in the past. So what's the, what's the legal uh, issues around this? I mean, obviously there's HIPAA and all this compliance. So wh where are you at with that? Are you breaking any rules? Uh, and, and how does that affect the actual monetary, um, you know, sort of transaction here? I don't see any transaction occurring here. And this is between an existing doctor. So you said you had a direct to consumer business. Is that so I can actually just meet a new doctor and have them look at my athlete's foot without being embarrassed and just rotate doctors? How does that work? Sure, sure. Yep. So uh, that's that's right. The the direct to consumer uh, system is for patients to speak to a doctor that they don't have a, a prior relationship with. And like I said, the goal is that those products are going to be merged together. We're basically we got feedback from the doctors on that product that they wanted to use this with their own patients because they wanted one spot that they can go to to manage ah. all of their after hours care. Uh, whether it's their own patients or new patients that we're going to be sourcing for them. So, so when you started the business, it was originally get a doctor and get mm -hmm. uh, get serviced and get care from that doctor. And then the doctors told you, wait a second, I, th that's not my issue is getting new patients. It's managing my existing patients. Right. Well, we saw that they wanted to do both. So uh, we actually came back and built this product for them. And then from this product, they'll have the ability to treat new patients as well as offer paid calls to their existing patients with some heavier services like you're talking about, such as photo sharing and video conferencing. So here's the direct to consumer. If you go to ringadoc.com slash patients, you can see sick, feel better right now. Ring a doc, get you a doctor on the phone right now. The call is just $40 and the doctor will help you figure out what's wrong and what to do next. Uh, no insurance, no problem. It's forty dollars. And so, how does that work? Um, do I just do the payment online? I see, I do. Uh, so I sign yep. up here, mm -hmm. 
and then I just put my phone number in and then they email me back? How does that work? Uh, f so for that product, you actually just call. Uh, you call the number that's given to you after you register. Ah. You enter your PIN code and you wait, basically wait on hold while we get you a doctor instantly. Uh, and who to, are those doctors? Is it like 10 doctors who you've contracted out to or is it like a bank of doctors? How does that work? Sure. So it's actually a physician network that we've we've curated ourselves, uh, and it, the doctors range from younger, more tech savvy physicians all the way towards the older physicians that are moving towards retirement and are looking for some other ways to supplement their income. So it's a nice variety of primary care physicians in California. So let's say, is the appeal of the direct to consumer? I just want to stick on that for a minute, and then we'll mm -hmm. sort of talk about your entrepreneurial journey to build the doctor software as a service product. Um, oh, by the way, Jason, I got I got your missed call from the message you sent me. It good, just good. Up here. <laughs> um, so now is the idea here for these doctors that consumers, there's a large group of consumers who don't go to the doctor because A, they're embarrassed, B, they're concerned about the bill, and C, they just don't have one yet. Mm -hmm. are, are those yeah. the reasons that people give? I'm curious. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's a variety of reasons. For the most part, the people that are using that product that we've been piloting is convenience factor. You know, for instance, I had a, a buddy call me a couple weeks ago, and he has a primary care physician, and he couldn't get in touch with his primary care physician because the answering service product, the one that we just demonstrated, was so, it's, it's crappy 1970s call center technology. He couldn't get in touch with his primary care physician, so he went to our network through the direct-to-consumer product. And how come the direct-to-consumer product isn't an app like Uber? Like, I would think if I just went in there, clicked it, could put my credit card information, and then if I need something embarrassing like a, Vi a Viagra or, you know, uh, whatever the, uh, you know, athlete's foot or, I don't know, something, an STD, whatever it is, I'm embarrassed about it or whatever, I could actually just use that and get my Viagra filled or my uh, athlete's foot filled or whatever it is. I mean, why isn't there an app for that? Sure. So uh, first of all, no Viagra, unfortunately. So I don't, don't mean to... Uh, to why not? Why not? Is that something you have to do in person? Yeah, there's no, no controlled substances, no lifestyle drugs, and no long-term prescriptions. Uh, uh, if, if you're talking to a new physician that you don't have an in-person relationship with. Uh, um, so, why is that? And, is that you have to do in person for those kind of... I don't know mm -hmm, the laws yeah, around I mean, it. Is that just some decision you made, or is that the actual like law in the United States? It's it's a decision that we've made to be cautious along the guidelines of what the medical board suggests. Now those are changing as we realize that telemedicine and telehealth, in particular, is a really really big way to solve some of the issues in healthcare today. Um, but the reason that the app, so the app on the patient side is on its way. Uh, right now we've seen that the patients are fine using just the phone as an entry point, but we're the first step was to release the physician app, and then the second step is to release the patient app once the physicians get comfortable using this kind of Netflix-type Q-ish system yeah. to handle all of their calls. See, it would say, seem to me that you have these poor people who live in rural areas who are an hour's drive or to a physician, and it's very inconvenient, but they could, if they had a situation, get a prescription for whatever it is. Let's say they needed you know, a Z-Pack, they, they had some sort of flu, and the doctor could very quickly determine that through telemedicine, through your iPhone, through a picture, through your symptoms, mm -hmm. the same way they would in person, and then put the order in for the Z-Pack, and, and you have it delivered to you by FedEx or UPS the next day. So you're not right. doing that because you're just concerned of abuse? Is that the issue? Oh, no, no. We, we, so we are doing that. There just isn't an app, an app for it right, huh. right yet. The, the patient-facing app is on its way. We're currently working on that right now. But, what, but what's the... Is, there, is it that you're not doing certain drugs? Uh, oh, like yes. If I wanted yeah, a Z-Pack, so, I could get that, but I couldn't get yes. Oxycontin or something? Correct. You can get a Z-Pack. That's a, that's a very common one, but you can't get Oxy, Oxycontin. Right. Okay. So I see. So you're basically... The number one thing that people are going to say when they see this is, oh, this is something that you could be abused for doctor shopping. So you've taken, as an entrepreneur, a preemptive strike and say, we're just not going to service that stuff. Exactly. There's a lot of online pharmacies where you can get that, and basically you fill out a simple questionnaire. You don't even really speak to a physician. This is for, you know, this is to be sort of the front line of medical care. Right. So you can speak to a physician and actually get a, a prescription for something applicable to what you have rather than filling out some silly questionnaire. Oh, is that right? So people can go online and fill out a form, and a doctor they, reviews it, and they could get Oxycontin shipped to them? Is that how? 
that, there's a lot of really there's a lot of really um, sketchy sort of businesses out there, and that's why we really wanted to change the focus towards mm -hmm. really improving the existing patient physician relationship in person, right. as well as opening that opening that channel to other consumers that may not have an in-person physician. I got it. I got it. So um, now, what about emergency care? Right. So. This must come up, and I'm really fascinated by your thinking as an entrepreneur as to, you know, innovating versus just getting caught up in, you know, potential abuses of the system. But let's say it was an emergency situation. Do you see a time when I'm, I'm on a farm somewhere, right? Again, we'll go with the rural one since there, and I know that a helicopter, you know, evac unit's going to take 20 minutes and an ambulance going to take an hour. So I've got to deal with this person having a heart attack in for the next 20 minutes or something. I'm in the field and somebody has their iPhone there. Is the, is, mm -hmm. the, is the concept of I could click an emergency button, show a videotape and have somebody tell me what to do out of the question in your mind? Or is that something that we'll see it in our lifetime? Oh, absolutely. That's something that we'll definitely see in our lifetime uh, with, with the expanse of uh, broadband connectivity and the ability for these, you know, the, the devices in our hands to do so much. We'll be able to see a lot of, you know, really, really exciting things, especially hooks into the local emergency uh, room uh, so that based on the, the location of the actual phone, it can populate what's the closest ER, what's the closest level one trauma center, who are the closest physicians that are on call, and how do we get in contact with them in the best way. And that's why we wanted to leverage the existing technology so that we are using the iPhones that we carry around rather than you know, a, a big bulky telemedicine unit or larger solution that you know, is also out in some of those hospitals today. So you see a time when I could take out my iPhone, click on ring a doc and say, this is an emergency. It says, what kind of emergency? I say, uh, this is somebody who's got in a car accident and it uh, automatically starts streaming video, pings the emergency doctors who are on call through the 911 system and they actually can see the video as they're driving to the scene and see exactly what they're coming to. Sure, yeah, I, I, I definitely don't see that out of the question. I mean, obviously right now we're not focused on emergencies or if you are if you cut your arm open or you think you broke your arm, you know, right now you do have to go to the ER just because we don't have the infrastructure yet. Right. But in the future, once once we build this network up, uh, that's those are some possibilities that I could see, you know, a couple years from now, if not a little bit more probably is more realistic. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fascinating too. I, I used to work on an ambulance, Bravo Volunteer Ambulance Service in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Uh, when I was 19 or 20, I was an EMT first responder, which was like the lowest level of it. Um, but I used to ride on the ambulance and we used to have to call in, hey, we're going to my mom and ease, or we're going to Victory Memorial and here's the status of the patient. That was my job in the passenger seat, rattling off the blood mm -hmm. pressure and all that kind of stuff. But boy, if you could actually put sense on somebody and video and have that being, you know, shown, it would actually prepare the ER for what to expect. Right, right. And what's really great about, I mean, trends outside of what we're doing, we, we're looking to just really be the, the communication platform for all outside of the office patient physician communication, kind of the backbone for that. But there's some really interesting opportunities in the future, not, you know, not in the short term, six month, 12, 12 month, but two to four year period of integration with, you know, electronic health records that have a lot of data on patients so that when you do show up at the ER, they're able to pull that information as well as they, they've been reading sensors that may or may not have been on the patient's body. How do people, and by people I mean doctors, look at the recording and digital asset here of them giving feedback over the phone? So, for example, if you did have you know, some symptoms that look like the flu and I tell you, hey, this looks like, this looks like the flu, I'm going to uh, give you a Z-Pack, and that's recorded and kept for all history, and it turns out you had something worse. Are doctors looking at that saying, I want the paper slash data trail, audio trail of my voice diagnosing incorrectly or underdiagnosing because at least that's better than people claiming that I did something? How do they look at that like permanent record of interactions with patients? Is it a positive or is it a negative? So that's a great question, and I would say... It's a positive. Uh, actually, a lot of the doctors like the fact that the out-of-office care is now, between their own patients is now being documented. So the fact that it is recorded and there is an audit trail of it, uh, this is really important in the case of, say, that I'm your physician and I'm out of town and one of my colleagues I've identified is covering for me. If you have a conversation with that colleague, that definitely right now is not being tracked. So it's almost actually a more legitimate system of cross-coverage care that we're providing because, I mean, doctors are professionals. They, they've been providing, and 
most people don't realize this, they've been providing out-of-office care and phone calls for decades. This is actually a system to legitimize the work that they're already doing out of the office and, and actually give more of a protection and liability, less liability to them. Yeah, I mean, I would think if the recordings were kept, insurance companies might say, and they could audit them, and they could actually look at the behavior of the doctor, they might actually lower their insurance rates. Because, <laughs> I mean, isn't that what's putting private practice, from what I've read, it's incredibly hard to be in private practice because of insurance. And this might actually be something where not dissimilar to car companies who saying if you drive less miles or if you drive under certain speeds, we'll give you discounted insurance. Is it possible that doctors who are audited and their conversations are recorded would get lower insurance eventually? So one, one of the one of the, the big macro trends is you're correct is the, the closing of small physician practices and that's why we've actually positioned this product to be a way to in the future drive incremental revenue from patient consultations and from actually hopefully insurance reimbursement. There was actually a bill passed two weeks ago in California uh, that stronger mandates for reimbursement for telehealth. So that definitely will be a point that we can kind of bring back more control to those smaller physicians that are getting squeezed. Listen, I think what you're doing is fantastic work. I think it's very important, and I think it's transformative. Uh, Jordan Michael, CEO and co-founder of Ring-A-Doc. Where are you guys based? Uh, we're in San Francisco, California. We were originally in Los Angeles, but we yeah. moved up to San Francisco in May. And the, who's, who from the Founders Fund? Is it Luke? Who's, who's involved with you? Uh, it's actually Howard. We were, we were uh -huh. dealing with Bruce Gibney, uh, but now it's Howard. We're dealing and, with. and so you guys raised an angel round or an A round? Yeah, actually, we just announced that we've added 500,000 uh, more onto the convertible debt round today. So we've raised 1.2 million in total. Uh, that's led by, as you know, as as you mentioned, Founders Fund. Listen, I think this is a fantastic idea. I think that uh, you 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 really could do something transformative here. Obviously, I'm an investor in Uber, as people know, and this just screams Uber. So I'd love to get a cup of coffee with you next time in, I'm in San Francisco, and continued success. Great. Uh, everybody check out Ring a Doc, and I'm, I'm going to take a guess that they're on Angel List. I don't want to solicit for them on their behalf. I don't want to say yes, I'm interested. <laughs> I don't want to say I'm interested in investing as an angel investor, but I am. And I don't want to say you should be, but maybe you should be after you hear this in and you say, wow, this, this has shades of Uber to me. I think it's fantastic. Michael uh, Jordan, I almost called you Michael Jordan. You get that a lot, huh, Jordan Michaels? Yeah, my parents are basketball fans. So uh, growing up in the 90s, I got that quite a bit. Oh, you're kidding me. You're, so your dad's <laughs> Mr. Michael is your dad. What's yep. his first name? His name's Elliot. He's from Brooklyn. He grew up, played basketball out in, out in Brooklyn. So I think, Where in Brooklyn? Claim, uh, he played at LIU Brooklyn. Oh, LIU, you said? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, okay. So your dad, Elliot Michaels, decides, hey, I'm going to name my son <laughs> Jordan Michael so he can be tortured in high school. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was intentional, but you know, I do come from a from a sports family, so they definitely are are large basketball fans. Uh, so when you're playing pickup it, games, is everybody like Jordan? Jordan, you're no Jordan, Michael Jordan. When you miss, um, you know, in, in eighth grade, I had a teacher make a comment that I was the complete opposite of Michael Jordan, being uh, being short and white. But uh, you yeah, know, it, I think it's made me stronger. <laughs> Absolutely, I would be torturing you on the basketball court. Hey, listen, uh, Jordan Michaels, uh, great job, and um, I can't wait to meet with you when I'm up there. Um, so awesome. that was really thanks, interesting. Uh, thanks for coming on the program. And uh, another thing you're going to find interesting is our friends over at Igloo Software. These guys uh, and gals, I don't. The team over there. I'm always trying to get like gender specific. I'm trying to get people to use gender neutral uh, ways of describing. So the team at Igloo, I, you know, because I constantly have people who I do business with say, oh, yeah, the girls are handling that. And I was in a meeting with this reality TV producer and he's like, yeah, you know, I got a girl for that. And I looked at him and I said in the middle of a meeting with like two other people, do you literally have a girl or do you have a woman? And he said, well, she's like 25. And I was like, do you know that it really women don't like when you call them girls? And he said, no, I, I didn't perceive that. And I, there was another woman in the meeting. I, and I just asked her, do you find it offensive? And she said, yeah, it kind of perturbs me. And he was like, oh, my God. So anyway, um, don't call women girls. Just say people or their names. Kieran. Uh, Brandis. Just call them by their names. You don't have to call them girls. So like, if you called a bunch of guys boys, they would be offended. Anyway, listen. The team over at Igloo Software... A little bit of a tangent. Uh, 
build an internet you're actually going to like. And we use it here. Uh, all the sponsors information we put inside of Igloo. So that if we have something about Snap Terms or MailChimp or Igloo or Hiscox, all that data is stored inside of the This Week in uh, Internet. And we keep our calendar of all the shows that are coming up, the pre-tapes, etc. So I don't have to ask, hey, what's going on in the show? Oh, look, Howard Linson and Gina Biancini is, are, B and Chini are both going to be on the news roundtable on Friday. Awesome. Awesome. Dave McClure on the following week. I can see all that stuff. Know what's going on. And even boring stuff like all of our equipment and, you know, what we have. So then let's see if it's one o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what is the equipment we have? Oh, let me go check that out. And then uh, figure out where we're at. All this great stuff, all this great collaboration is done in a fully hosted and managed in the cloud in a secure business context. Thank you to my friends at Igloo for providing this to us and to people like IDC, Deloitte, NetApp, Kimberly Clark, RSA. That's kind of impressive, RSA. And Aetna Insurance. All these great folks are using the amazing intranet software by Igloo. Uh, everybody go ahead and thank at Igloo Software. And by the way, if you go to igloosoftware.com slash this weekend, you can uh, enter a drawing for the free iPad mini. So don't uh, forget to do that, igloosoftware.com slash this weekend. Get a free 30-day trial and enter to win an iPad mini. The last day for the iPad mini, this Thursday, January 31st. So get in there right now, igloosoftware.com slash this weekend to get a free 30-day trial. I love reading ads by products that I like and love. It makes it so much easier for me. Oh, thank you, Igloo Software, for making a product I love. And go ahead to go to igloosoftware.com slash this weekend. I say Igloo Software, you say secure internet. Let's do an Ask Jason segment. Oh, there's no bumper? <laughs> I was like, let's do an Ask Jason segment. I figured they're going to play like some, like, you know, 10 second thing. Uh, Andy, uh, you're a su super fan. Andy, are you there? Yeah, yeah. How is it, Jason? I am well. Uh, let's just check. Uh, Andy, can you count to uh, five for me, please? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Great. Okay. So, Andy, uh, you have a favorite episode. This is what I want. Hey, uh, Brandis uh, and um, Bryce, Kieran, when the super fans come on to ask questions, can we just, they, sh they should start the salutation interaction with me uh, just by saying what's their favorite episode number. So they just say like 77, and we know that it's whoever, or they'd say 105. We know who that is. So who's your favorite, uh, you have a favorite guest, Andy, on the program? Yeah, you know, I, I would have said Saka, but I I recently listened to that Howard Lindzen one. Ah, uh, that, that was pretty amazing because he wasn't the, you know your traditional tech kind of entrepreneur. He was more no, of a, he's out there, investor, business guy. Um, that was, yeah, that was a hell of an episode. Yeah, I, you know, I have to say I was surprised because you know when I'm doing the interviews, I it's hard. I, I knew Saka was going to be a legendary one, but with Howard, he's so all over the place and he's so stream of consciousness. I was like, I'm having a hard time keeping up with this guy. Like, is he on speed or something? Like, I, I can't keep up with him. He keeps bouncing off the walls, and he's contradicting himself, and then going on to the next subject and circling back around. And for me, it was like pinball, and everybody says the same thing. They love the episode with Howard Lindzen, and he's going to be on again this Friday. So, Andy, uh, tell us, what is your question on Ask Jason? Okay, so uh, I've, I've got a startup called uh, realtimeone.com, um, and I'm from South Africa. So a, a little bit of context to the question, I suppose, is... In South Africa, we've got a, a fairly young but rapidly growing tech industry. You would have met some of them on those those meetup shows that you've done. Yep. Um, and, and as you'd know, in any young industry, the investment cycle is kind of still in the low risk phase. Hmm. So investors aren't seeing big enough and quick enough exits. They are therefore not willing to take, you know, lots of high risk. Um, High risk investments. So we tend to raise uh, in our industry anywhere between fifty thousand dollars and two hundred thousand dollars on the upper end. There's one or two kind of exceptions that prove the rule, but that's pretty much there. So in that kind of environment where you don't have a lot of burn, your options are limited. You have to keep it extremely lean. You have to hustle. You have to hack. Uh, most of the time, you don't you you don't get to pay yourself a salary as a founder, which means you know it's put bread on the table and support the wife and kids. Uh, you have to earn money on the side. So if you're a single founder and you're not paying yourself a salary, therefore you don't have enough money to pay anyone else a salary, uh, it can get kind of lonely. Not depression lonely. I mean, yeah. I love this stuff. I, I wouldn't do it any other way. But, you know, when you've got no one to high five when something goes goes right and you've got no one to prop you, prop you up when something goes wrong. So that's that's my question is what advice do you have besides, I'd say, the obvious harden the F up? Um, and and yeah. what tricks have you seen? 
this is a great question. Yeah. Motivate themselves. It's a great question. Listen, being an entrepreneur is incredibly isolating, um, I find, uh, at times. And you have to basically curate your life to have it not be isolating. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, somebody's a founder of a great company, and they are running out of runway. The product's not kicking in. Some large company creates a competitive product. Everybody in the press is saying this darling company now is going to get destroyed by this big company that just copied their functionality. And they have a board of some investors. They have employees, but they don't have a co-founder and they have nobody to talk to about exactly how bad it is. Because if you're the employee, the leader doesn't want to show weakness and say, I think we could be out of business in six months. And you don't want to go to your board and show weakness and say, I think we might have to be, a, be out of business in six months. This is really bad. What do we do? Even though it might actually be the right thing to do is to be honest like that. People love honesty in their leader, but people's perception is I don't want to rattle people. If I start telling my employees that this is a really bad situation, they might leave. And if I tell my investors this is a really bad situation, they might want to sell the company or not believe in me. And so there's this constant battle like of the worse the news is, the less you have support. And the better the news is that everybody's talking, right? And so... Leaders define reality, right? We had um, uh, Warren uh, Bennis on the program, and he, he talked about that. You have to define reality for your team, and then if your team is just you or one or two people, it gets pretty lonely. So what I suggest is creating a founder-CEO club and bring them together with the explicit purpose of, in private, talking about what is the biggest problem they're facing. And every two weeks or every month, you'll lock in this dinner, and it's a code of... Uh, honor that nobody, anything that's said at the dinner doesn't leave the dinner. And the point of the dinner is for everybody to help solve everybody else's problem. So you got five guys and gals, five people, non-gender specific language, you got five executives, five founders around the table. Each of the five founders takes five or 10 minutes to explain how bad things are, the worst possible thing they're dealing with, the hardest thing. Everybody gives advice. You do it four or five times. It takes half an hour each. And now you're talking about a great meal. And everybody leaves with this great sense of enthusiasm. You throw in a bottle of wine and some great appetizers, maybe a little uh, dessert. And boy, what an evening. To me, that's fantastic. And I've been doing that my whole life. I bring people together. And, and I try to do that. But, but of course, you think you're busy. And, you know, um, you get more and more isolated. So it's it's hard. It's, I really like the fact that in South Africa, you guys are on a shoestring and really having to push hard to make this stuff happen. It's going to make you disciplined. And boy, does your product look good. It's a really well-designed product. I'm looking at real-time wine right now. Um, and I like the concept, sharing your, uh, you know, what you're experiencing. But sharing and having dinner is the ultimate antidepressant. And uh, what's his name? Tom Cruise. Everybody made fun of him. Oh, he's a Scientologist. Oh, he's a kook. He's jumping up down on a couch. You know what the truth is? He did get some things right there. Uh, and I, I, listen, I'm not uh, pushing uh, L. Ron Hubbard or Scientology on anybody, but they happen to be right in that uh, exercising and talking to other people and sharing a meal does relieve anxiety. And the people who isolate themselves get more anxious and more depressed. So you need to go out and find people and bond with them and create your own little support group for founders, by founders, for founders. Does that help, Andy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's another interesting thing about young industries is that people are, they haven't grown up to the point where they, they can share free. So there's not a huge amount of sharing about, you know, take something simple like user numbers in South Africa. People don't share it because you know, usually they've got to pull the wool over someone's eyes in order to make it up. Right. Uh, but it's, it's getting there and those kind of things do need to happen more. You're right. Well, you know what you do is you find, all you have to do is find one person and say, listen, I will give you every piece of information I have. You give me every piece of information you have, and we're going to be in it together. And then you get the next person, and you get them to agree, and you just build your own little support group. And, you know, I have that relationship with a lot of folks who they'll just tell me every, Like Jason Nazar is a good friend of mine from DocSoc. Like, we'll tell each other everything. We'll share a bunch of information. And, and other people like that will just, just put open kimono, tell everybody everything. Um, and that's part of 
how things have changed here in the United States. I, I was saying on the program 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you wanted to even get a term sheet and you asked another entrepreneur, hey, can I see your term sheet? They'd be like, no, 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 I can't show it to you. Now you got the VCs posting term sheets online, explaining all the details of them. You know, good people like Brad Feld or Fred Wilson or Mark Seuss are all very transparent and open or, you know, uh, venture hacks, angel hack uh, teams, Nivian, Naval. They're very out there saying like, hey, here's how it's done. So all that information is there, and, and, and that's what grows the community. And you guys and gals down in uh, South Africa need to sort of take a, a page from the playbook that's worked really well in the United States. Sharing is caring. That it is. <laughs> all right. Listen, Andy, well done. Good question. Let's go on to John Schippel. Schippel, you there? Hi, I'm here. It's uh, Scheipel. Scheipel. But thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, you have a favorite episode? Um. I Favorite like guest? just about any episode with Mark Jeffrey. He's a, a friend of mine. Oh, well, he's fantastic. He was involved early on. Um, but no, I'm just passionate about startups. So Great. Uh, I have a hard time choosing. Let's hear your question. So my question is this, and, and I'm, I'm a consulting CTO, so it's a slightly uh, loaded question. And sure. I'm here at one of my clients called Relish Mix. They're a analytics and intelligence for movies and TV. But the question I have is, how do you create the best possible working relationship between the CEO and the CTO? Now, I come from a tech perspective, so that's why I'm asking, you know, kind of the, the Los Angeles CEO of CEOs huh. uh, what your perspective is. So. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, obviously, I famously had Brian Alvey as my partner, and he was the CTO as the CEO at Weblogs, Inc. He, of course, went on to do CrowdFusion, which is now uh, Saros, and he's doing great. But he's the CEO now, and he has that same thing with, I guess, his CTO, I think, is Craig. Um, and and uh, I think now Brian's not the CEO. But anyway, point is, I've been through this, and, uh, and also with Mark Jeffrey, was his uh, CTO here at uh, Mahalo for a while. It is a balance because the CEO is out there making promises. The CTO actually has to deliver. There's deadlines and there's this sort of natural tension back and forth of what the CEO is trying to deliver. And the CEO generally doesn't have the time to be on top of everything. The CTO generally doesn't have um, insights into everything that the CEO is doing. So I think regularly um, breaking bread and talking about what's working. And the technique I used to use was I would do like... Um, if, if things are going well, I wouldn't drill down too much. If things were problematic, that's when I would uh, obviously get more involved. But I would like to walk through their thinking as a CEO and to say, hey, what is everybody working on? And we would do what we call a stand-up. Just, hey, let's all just stand up and talk about how everything's going. And we would go through each of the 10 people on the tech team or 15 people or five people and say, what is everybody working on right now? And why is it important? And what is the impact on the business? So... Sometimes when you say, hey, tell me what every single person is working on right now, people could be offended, right? Like, oh, well, you don't trust me? Uh, or, well, just let them work. And what, you know. But however, if I, as the CEO, give uh, the business perspective on that feature, so, oh, yeah, this person's cleaning up the database and making sure that it's uh, you know, uh, as fast as possible. This person is working on uh, this feature. This person is working on this thing that a client you know, wanted. And I could say, okay, hold on a second. The client work is important for this reason, because if we get that work right with that client, they're happy, they're going to give us a testimonial that will get us the next client. The Making the database faster, that's always virtuous. But this other feature that we think is speculatively good, let's have a discussion of why we're building that exactly. Who are we building that for? Oh, because we think it's... But did any client tell us they wanted that? Or is it going to invest... A, is that going to impress the hell out of a VC and get us more investment? Is it going to be something we're going to show at a conference. Why are we doing it, right? And so what do you, that's what where what the... Do you do if, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, what do you do if, if this kind of pie-in-the-sky you know, CEO talk is freaking the CTO out, right? Like I've had CEOs tell me, uh, if I ask you, uh, if you tell me you think it's a good idea, do you think I'm building it? And half the time they say, yeah. And I just was saying it's a good idea. You see yeah. what I'm saying? I, so I think agreeing on the roadmap and agreeing on the order in which we're, you're going to execute and why, it's not like CTOs can't understand business, and it's not like CEOs can't understand technology. It's that they've chosen different paths because they're different skill sets. So if you start with the recognition that, hey, listen, the CEO can understand the technology, and the technology person can understand the business case, if you're smart enough to be CTO, you're smart enough to understand the business case, and if you're smart enough to be the CEO you're smart enough to understand the technology, even if you can't do it yourself necessarily. So I think that 
the recognition of that and being true partners in, hey, we're going to execute against this roadmap. And by the way, it's going to change. Um, and if the CTO doesn't want to hear that stuff, then I don't think they're going to be a particularly successful CTO. And I've seen CTOs like that who are just like, just tell me what to do and I will do it. I'll get through the punch list. I mean, that can be, that, that's a missed opportunity for the CTO not to get out of the day to day and the roadmap and look at the big business case. So one of the things is I would bring Brian Alvey with me and he was my partner, you know, as much as he was CTO, but he would come with me to go meet with Mark Cuban at the all-star game, or he would come with me to meet with a client or to meet with, Peter Rojas to try to recruit him to do Engadget with us. Like, so getting the CTO out of the building and into the business flow, that's virtuous. Getting the CEO to come to the code jam and hang out and have dinner with all the developers during the code jam and take them all out to dinner, that speaks volumes. Most of the time, it's when these turf wars happen and people are not communicating that things can break down between the CEO and CTO, and obviously when there's pressure and people are not performing, um, then these things can really break down and you really have to double down on communication. Excellent. That's great feedback. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, John, uh, great meeting you. And uh, let's go on to our next question, which is Ed Hardy. I hope I'm giving good answers. Ed, how you doing? Yeah, hi, Jason. I'm doing well, thanks. Um, wait a second. How old are you? 16. Oh, my God. It's getting younger and younger. So you're a 16-year-old <laughs> entrepreneur and uh, you're in London? Yeah. Um, I'm actually at a boarding school just outside London, but London-based most of the time. So uh, I take it this week in Startup is very popular in your boarding school? <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure, yes, absolutely. Right after Downton Abbey. We watch Downton Abbey, Sherlock, and then this week in Startups in that order. All right, what's your question? Um, so basically, do you think that London or Berlin or any other European startup hub can ever be able to match Silicon Valley uh, while universities and schools continue to sort of not connect with it or sort of recognize going into a startup as sort of a, a valid industry or like even acknowledge it. I mean, like particularly here at my school, just <laughs> you go and you go into a bank and then you go on, you have your family and that, that's it. That's sort of the accepted career path. Yeah. And it's, um, it's something that sort of is changing slowly, but I don't, I, I think more in America, and it's something I think will, that I think it will help London grow, but at the moment, it's just not getting that kind of support from schools and universities that it needs. I think in your lifetime, it's not gonna happen. Um, these things take generations to happen. So in order for London to become a tech hub, you know, on the, or, or Berlin on the scale of Silicon Valley, you would need to have three, four, five generations, or three generations of, you know, exceptional growth and Silicon Valley would have to be stagnant, right? So I don't think Silicon Valley is going to become stagnant. If anything, it's getting, it's accelerating and the gap between Silicon Valley and the other places might in fact be increasing. That doesn't mean individuals can't create amazing companies outside of Silicon Valley, but we're comparing overall, you know, the ecosystems. Unless Google and Facebook and Twitter and all these people decided to be in these other countries, it's going to be very hard because you're not going to have hundreds of millionaires leaving those big companies with their stock options to go invest in other companies. So it's, we had Brad Feld on the program um, and he built Boulder up. I don't think even he would say Boulder is going to catch up to the Valley anytime soon. However, Boulder can produce meaningful startups, right? So those are two different things. One is eclipsing Silicon Valley. I don't think anybody's going to eclipse Silicon Valley in our lifetime. Perhaps you know, Shanghai or, you know, maybe a developing country like that, perhaps because of the scale of it, maybe, but I don't think so actually, because uh, again, of the fluidity and the cultural things that you point out, which are huge. Europe is anti-entrepreneurship in many ways. The laws are set up to be anti-entrepreneurship. The expectation culturally is that entrepreneurs are in many countries looked down upon, uh, as you just said, like your family would much rather you prefer you become a banker, wanker than a, you know, entrepreneur. So I think the deck is stacked. And I think for a young person like yourself, get the hell out of Dodge and go to the Valley or go to New York or go to Los Angeles or go to a tech hub that really is taking it seriously and learn and see how good it's going. And then maybe you can go back and you've got a lot of skills and a lot of network and you can always come back to London or go to Berlin. But I think for a young person, if you were my son or something, or if you were my friend, I would just say, get the hell out of there. Just like if you want to make movies, you got to be in Los Angeles. 
right? I had a friend who was a director, my friend Nick Tarecki. He just did this incredible film, Arbitrage, which Richard Gere got nominated for a Golden Globe, and it's an incredible film. And he was in New York, and he's like trying to make filmmaking work in New York, and I moved to L.A., and I was like, get the hell out of New York and get to L.A. He goes to L.A., I go to his party the other night, and he's got every famous person in the world at his party. It's just easier when people are down the street. So I think for you, the second you get a chance and you're done with that godforsaken boarding school, go to the Valley. Forget about college. That's a waste of time. That's just not worth it in terms of spending 100,000 pounds or 200,000 pounds uh, on school and then you get a piece of paper. You put that 100,000, 50,000 pounds uh, towards a startup company. You do it three times. You're going to have success. So I, the answer is it's not going to happen. And it's not your job to make it happen. Your job is to make Ed Hardy successful. Your job is to have Ed Hardy put a dent in the universe. You understand what I'm saying, Ed? Yeah, super. Thank you very much. What are you working on? You got a startup? Um, yeah, I'm uh, working with uh, a startup called Quato Studios, uh, which is it's Palo Alto and London based, and it's sort of it's gamifying coding uh, for the sort of for the younger market. It's uh, we're launching our product sort of in the next couple of months, and it's going to be a nice nice iPad app. So that's I think it's one to look out for. It's exciting, cool. and then I've got my own startup uh, called Resort Review, and uh, we basically aggregate a whole load of data on different resorts. Uh, we group them together. So on top of user reviews, you've got sort of the data to consolidate that and uh, improve conversion rates. But that's still very early stages. So why don't you come to the launch festival on March 4th, 5th, and 6th? You could take part in the, uh, in the hackathon. And uh, you come for the hackathon, and then you stay for, uh, and, you, and you launch Cato Studios. <laughs> I'd love to, but I'm at school. <laughs> Ugh. See, with that attitude, you're not going to get far, Ed. You've got to be able to break some rules. <laughs> Can't you just leave yeah. school and then you get suspended? What's the worst that can happen? They throw you out? What are you, a uh, sophomore or junior? Well. You're sophomore or junior there? Um, uh, How does it work? You, doing, you, it's, two yeah, more years so left? I'm still doing my... I've got, yeah, after this, two more years left. And if you were to cut school for a week and come to the U.S. for the launch festival, would they kick you out? Yeah. <laughs> Man, that kind of sucks. Maybe you can play on this yeah. tape and tell them I invited you and you can come. And that you get, like, can't, maybe they give you a credit or something. You should come. Yeah. Come to the... Well, you, cut, you come later. But you see, what are you, a developer? You, wanna, you, you program, you code, or you're a designer? What do you do? No, What's your skill? I, I, I'm not technical. Um, I'm not, yet. Of, mm -hmm. yeah. not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Listen, we'll the number see. one... You've got to have a skill. Listen to me. Yeah. Ed. You need to have a skill. That's how you break in. So you got to become either a world-class designer or a developer. You got to have some specific skill that helps a startup. So, you know, try, I mean, it's great that you're getting this generalized education in high school, but try to get a skill under your belt. Like UX is a major skill. Design is a major skill. Just buy the top 10 books on design and become an expert on design. Get Photoshop, whatever. You can steal off BitTorrent and, and just become good at like creating wireframes or something, mobile apps. Be a great designer. I think that's like, if you can get your head around that, there's an unlimited opportunity for you. Yeah, super. All right. You have a favorite episode? Your favorite, favorite guest on the program? Um, I, I like the Evernote one. That was good. Oh, Phil. A couple of weeks ago. Yeah, he was yeah. great. Phil's great. All right, Ed. Well, when I'm, when I'm over there in London town, we'll, uh, we'll grab a drink. Well, actually, no, we can't grab a drink. What, yeah, what's super. the drinking age over there, 18? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at it's your fun. boarding school, you we'll guys, you guys sneak, is it all boys, this boarding school? It is. It's all boys. So how do you sneak girls in? What do you what do you guys do? You guys sneak out on the weekends? How do you get girl? How do you meet girls? Uh, we find time. You are you allowed to leave the boarding school? Uh, every couple of weeks. Oh man, that's rough. How do you sneak? How do you sneak beers into the school? Is there like so the security <laughs> guard? You can give the security guard like ten pounds and he'll go get you a couple of beers, some Guinness. What what happens? Yeah, well, no, we're near a town. It's fine. Oh, you're near a town. All right. I'm just trying to figure out how it works over there. All right. Listen, this has been a great episode. Thank you so much to all the people who called in on the S. Jason segment. Congratulations to Ringadoc for creating a kick-ass product that I think is going to do really well. And we'll see you all live uh, February 8th, twistlive3.eventbrite.com. If you want to get
get on the waiting list. Go ahead, make sure you get on the waiting list. So if you're going to email me, like, try to get me in kind of thing, just put yourself on the waiting list so at least we can go in some kind of an order and get a couple people in there. We're going to need a bigger boat. I don't know if Rocket Space is going to be able to uh, keep hosting this. They're going to have to move some more desks out and get some more space in that Rocket Space. Um, thank you, GoToMeeting. Thank you, at Igloo. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.